All right, welcome everyone. My name is Greg Batchelor, and I'm representing the MIT Sloan Office of External Relations. Glad to be with all of you today. Welcome to MIT Sloan Alumni Online. We are kicking off our 2023 season with Ben Shields, Senior Lecturer in Managerial Communications here at MIT Sloan, and hosted once again by our moderator and fearless team captain, Jacqueline Selby, the founder of Sous Chef and an alumna from the Executive MBA Class of 2021. We have a great conversation in store for you today. Sloan Alumni Online brings you conversations with principled, innovative leaders who improve the world, embodying the mission of the MIT Sloan School of Management. Jackie has prepared some questions for Ben to get us started, and we'll hold time to get to our audience submitted questions towards the end of the hour. You can use the chat or the Q&A feature in your Zoom interface. Please feel free to update your Zoom name to include your program and class year. And drop us a note in the chat to let us know where you're tuning in from today. And you can even let us know if your team won in the Super Bowl. So <laughs> with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Jackie and Ben. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Greg. And a big thank you to the External Relations Office for your partnership on this series. Um, we appreciate all of you taking the time out of your day to be with us and to join us for the first installment in this series uh, in 2023. Um, I have to tell you the initial idea for the topic of today's discussion uh, came about over coffee with a friend. And it really is my privilege to introduce Professor Ben Shields to share his research and thoughtful insights on the topic with us today. Um, in January, I actually had the pleasure of taking his data-driven teams elective course. And one of the things that struck me most during that time was how actionable the materials um, were that we learned. And Ben does an incredible job of highlighting pointed examples in sports and drawing conclusions from those examples that are applicable across business and industry. And the frameworks and lessons that I learned during that time were really immediately actionable and useful. And as a result, I'm really excited for you to have the chance to learn from him today as well. So Ben, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. Uh, Jackie, it is my pleasure. And like you, I also wanted to applaud Greg and the entire external relations team for all that they do. I've been a part of MIT now for nine years, and one of the best parts of the job, hands down, is re-engaging with our alumni community. So it really is a pleasure for me to be here with you, Greg, and all of our alums that have decided to join us today. Thank you, Ben. Um, and then before we start, I would love for you to just share a little bit more about your background and experiences that will inform our, our discussion today. Yes, absolutely. So I got my PhD at the age of 26, which was pretty young. And I was deciding between going to a professor job or maybe going into industry. And I had an amazing opportunity to go work for ESPN, the sports media firm of the Walt Disney Company. And I walked in and again, I was 26. I looked like I was probably 16, if not a little bit younger. And my bosses empowered me with an incredible opportunity, which was to help the company build out its social media strategy and team. And I did that for about six years, had an incredible experience. But what it exposed me to was the power of data in building and managing a team. Because we were working in social media, we had tons of data about our team's performance. And it really got me curious about this topic of building and managing teams with data. Coming here to MIT, which is the land of data and analytics, I started to pursue that curiosity even more. And as I was developing my teaching, it brought me back to one of my major, major passions in life, which is sports. And I started to explore how leaders could build and manage teams more effectively using data. And it just so happens there are some amazing sports examples that we can use as inspiration to apply key principles to other contexts outside of sports. 
And so that's what part of I've been focused on at MIT over the last few years and was so thankful to have the experience with you in our data-driven data teams course to sort of explore that curriculum and how it applies to executives of all sectors. Well, thank you, Ben. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and I think a, a fun place for us to start today, our discussion is, of course, being fresh off the Super Bowl. Yes. We would love to hear your thoughts and analysis of the outcome. Yes. Well, first of all, I think most of us can agree that it was entertaining. Maybe even Philadelphia Eagles fans would say it was an entertaining Super Bowl. I hope they would say that. And what I want to point out is that it was a battle of two extremely talented and effective quarterbacks, Patrick Mahomes with the Chiefs, Jalen Hurts with the Eagles. But like all teams, it's not just one individual. What's interesting about both teams is coming into the Super Bowl, Pro Football Focus or PFF, a well-regarded football analytics website, ranked the Philadelphia Eagles offensive line, the people that protect the quarterback in order to throw, rank the Philadelphia Eagles offensive line number one for the entire season. And the Chiefs ended the season at rank number four. So not only do both of the teams have excellent quarterbacks, they also have excellent offensive lines and they help one another. And both teams also offensively had excellent wide receivers, running backs, so yes, the headlines are and should be about the tremendous quarterbacks that both teams had. But when you look at the broader offensive system and all the different pieces and how they work together, that's why we saw a lot of touchdowns and a lot of scoring and a lot of entertainment during that game. It's all the talent working together within a system to produce a result. Now, of course, I have to acknowledge, Jackie, and we sort of talked about this too, it's tough to see a game get decided by a penalty at the end, but it was the right call. Sports is about what the rules and regulations constrain, and that was the right call. It was a hold, but in the end, it didn't take away from what I think was an entertaining game and something that illustrated how talent and system work together to produce incredible results. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's dig into that a little bit more because you and I have discussed that corporate leaders can derive um, insights from sports and the data-driven data -driven decision tactics that are used in sports on a daily basis to improve their, their business outcomes. Yeah. Um, we've also discussed how those break into four individual components, mm -hmm. talent, systems, culture, and leadership. And you um, kind of highlighted that at a high level just now, but um, if we take each of those four um, in, in pieces. Yeah. So let's start with, with talent and the, the role of star players versus role players and, and how does that come about in, in a business context as well as sports? Absolutely. And this question is so important because anytime I talk about data-driven decision-making in sports, I do have to give credit to a pioneer, in fact, the pioneer, Bill James. If there are any baseball fans out there, you may know Bill James, who was a pioneer behind sabermetrics or the objective search of knowledge in baseball. And Bill James's ideas were applied in a very famous example. And again, I have to mention this just because I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't, in a very famous example of Moneyball which chronicled decision maker Billy Bean, who used to what used to be a ball player and then became general manager of the Oakland Athletics, his attempt to build a winning team with much fewer resources. So many of you may be familiar with the Michael Lewis book or the film starring Brad Pitt. Now, I would argue that Billy Bean has been tremendously successful in his career. To me, his number one achievement is being played by Brad Pitt in a film. Now, that's just, that's my own personal opinion. And I've got to give him kudos for that. But what Moneyball started to do, Jackie, is institute more of a data-driven approach to evaluating talent. And there were all sorts of conventional wisdom ways to say, hmm, he's a good ball player. He's, 
he looks like a certain good ball player, very conventional wisdom, ways of evaluating talent. And what Bean and his team did so successfully was try to limit some of those decision biases and look more at objective performance metrics, especially those that maybe other teams weren't looking at. Very famous example on base percentage. You don't have to be a baseball fan to appreciate this. But during this early Moneyball era, no one was looking at that statistic, but Bean and his team were. So the data existed. They just had the presence and the foresight to look at it and use it in their decision making. So that's a really important example of let's evaluate performance with the objective data that we have available and has set off a sea chain, a revolution in sports on talent evaluation and identification using data. And it all started in part with Moneyball. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and another key component too of this process is, is systems. So the process yeah. is put in place or strategy, role players, et cetera. So could you share a little bit more about, uh, about how that works? Sure, so it's all well and good, Jackie, to have excellent talent but how do they fit together? And how do you design a system that maximizes the specific skill sets of each member on your team? A good and relatively unfortunate example of this concept of talent and fit is the Los Angeles Lakers of the 2022 season. And for those of you that are basketball fans, you may appreciate this example. For those of you that aren't, this team assembled three superstars. LeBron James, arguably the greatest player of all time. Anthony Davis, who won an NBA championship with LeBron a couple of years ago. And then a former all-star by the name of Russell Westbrook, who also had won MVP when he played for the Oklahoma City Thunder. So we've got three superstars. And yet the team had very high expectations, but did not fulfill them. And I think that's probably putting it very politely. And part of the problem was the fit between the skill sets of those three. Historically, LeBron has often thrived when he is surrounded by great three-point shooters. Russell Westbrook, for instance, isn't one of those. That's just one of the reasons why it didn't work. And he ended up getting traded recently. And that's just an admission that, hey, we tried to put this talent together, couldn't quite figure out the right system in order for it to work as effectively as possible. So that is one example of a system gone wrong. I have another example that I always like to share, Jackie, and we talked about it in our class, of a team system that goes right. And it reminds me of the Formula One pit crew team. And this is the team from Red Bull, which has the world record for the fastest pit stop. And these pit stops really matter, right? They really matter. They can save teams precious milliseconds in an effort to beat their opponents. And so I'll just show you just a really quick clip of this because it is quick. And I want us to notice how all of the individual members of this team work together to achieve this common goal of an extremely fast pit stop. So let's take a look. So for me, Jackie, there, there are a few really interesting things happening with this team. Number one is every single person on the team 
has a unique and clearly defined role. And everyone knows what their role is. So very, very clearly defined roles. The other thing that stands out to me here is that every single person has an impact on the common goal of bringing down the pit stop time. That is, I know if I'm a tire gun person, if I don't do my job and I don't do it well, the amount of time that my team is in the pit stop is only going to increase. So there's very, very clear roles and responsibilities. And also every single person knows what their impact, either positively or negatively, is going to be on the team's performance. And I like this example because it drives home some of those fundamentals about building and managing high-performing teams. And yes, Greg, two seconds, it is absolutely amazing. The other thing that I would point out is you saw you know, people celebrating at the end. This is a real team too. So not only is it really focused on the job at hand, but they also work really hard to build camaraderie and good relationships among one another as well to achieve these incredible results. So Jackie, that's just a little bit about the importance of not just having the right talent, the right tire gun person, but also making sure that you design the system around the talent to achieve these incredible results. And the nice thing about this example is every single role and responsibility is not only distinct, but also measurable. So you can get a sense from a data perspective how each person is impacting that final goal. So that's a little bit about the interrelationship between talent and system and, and the role that data can play in getting those two components right. Well, in building upon that, so when you alluded to it just a moment ago was the, the notion that there's camaraderie built to yes. And so, you know, a lot of that comes comes back to, to culture and yeah. having kind of common values and building trust among the team. So could you mm -hmm. talk about just the role that that plays in, uh, in data-driven teams? Yeah, so we talk a lot about the importance of culture. Of course, it's one of the critical terms in organizational studies, and for good reason. It matters a lot. One of the things that I've observed with sports teams in particular is oftentimes they take the extra step, which is, yes, we say on the wall that we value these things in our culture, but I'm starting to see in my research, some teams actually measure whether or not people on the team exhibit that behavior, right? Again, all well and good for us to have up on the wall these values, but are, are, are those values actually influencing behavior on the team? Mm -hmm. So an example that I like to use is from the NBA, and this is from a longtime NBA player, executive, head coach, and he currently is the president of the Miami Heat, and that's Pat Riley. And he has a very specific definition of what he wants the Miami Heat culture to be. And he defines it as the hardest working, best conditioned, most professional, most unselfish, toughest, nastiest, most disliked team in the league. So that's pretty clear, I would say, about what he wants the culture to be. And you can see, you know, maybe these words are up on the wall, but how do these words get translated into actual behavior, both on and off the court? And one of the things that I've been fascinated by with Pat Riley and his work as a leader is he's actually taken a bit of a data-driven approach to getting people on his team to embody some of these behaviors. So for example, you may have heard of something called Pat Riley's career best effort. And part of the concept is every single year, try to get 1% better. And that's a wonderful concept. It's about incremental improvements and that's great. But the way that he measures getting 1% better is what to me is very fascinating. So he has developed a system over the years where not only do players get measured based on their on-court performance, so things like how many rebounds they get, how many points they score, 
how many assists they get, how many blocks, how many steals. Riley has also over time collected new forms of data that reference the specific cultural values that he's hoping for. Like, for instance, if you allow an opponent to run into you when you know that a foul will be called against him, also known as a charge, you get a point towards your overall score. If you dive for loose balls, you get a point. If you go after rebounds, whether you are likely to get them or not, you get a point. So these are just examples. The idea here is that there are specific behaviors that Riley is trying to uh, develop within his team and is quantifying those behaviors accordingly. And to me, that is a really good example of, yeah, we talk about culture, but how do we actually measure culture in a way that is going to change behavior on our team? And that's just one example. One of my other really favorite examples is very different from the world of sports about measuring culture. I've got uh, some young kids and one of them, their preschool teacher was looking to teach them the cultural value of kindness. And the behavior that she was looking to teach her children was helping friends. So if you help friends, you are thereby learning and practicing the value of kindness. And so what did she do? Every single time one of the kids in the class helped a friend, she took one of those little pom-poms, Jackie, and then she put a pom-pom in a jar. And when the class collectively got 100 pom-poms, they got a pajama party, which I guess in the world of four-year-olds is about the equivalent of winning a championship. But that is a very simple example of taking a value, a behavior that you're trying to promote, and then measuring against it to hopefully create a long-lasting change. And this topic is, to me, fascinating. We're still in the very early stages of measuring culture, I think. Our colleague at MIT Sloan, Don Sol, has also done excellent work there. But I think as we look to build and manage high-performing teams, we're going to need to continue to spend some time on this topic. No, absolutely. And I think the, the key thing you brought about, too, in the, the last two examples, both with Pat Riley and, and the preschool teacher, is their leadership role. I mean, with their guidance is one of the key reasons why the culture was developed as it was. Yes. So could you talk a little bit more about that and the importance of leadership and creating those common goals? Yeah, absolutely. And look, high-performing teams don't work without strong leadership. Just plain and simple, right? And I think it is a unique leadership's choice on talent and system and the culture that you want to create. That is a, a leader's choice, a set of choices that a leader has to make. And you know how you tinker with these various elements will determine whether or not you achieve your common goal. One example that I followed recently is Becky Hammond. For those of you that don't know, Becky Hammond was an incredible WNBA player. She then went and coached the uh, San Antonio Spurs. She was an assistant coach on head coach Greg Popovich's staff. And then she took the job as a head coach for the Las Vegas Aces, a WNBA team. And what's interesting about Hammond is that a lot of people thought that she should get an NBA head coaching job. For a variety of reasons, she ended up getting the Las Vegas Aces job and has done an incredible job with very high expectations. And some of the things that she did come back to talent, system, and culture, okay? So as an example, she inherited a team and the way that they used to play was in part built around the skills and talents of a very good player, almost a legendary player, Liz Cambage, who was more of a, a post-up player, spent a lot of time inside near the basket. And Liz ended up getting moved to another team, going to another team, which meant that Becky Hammond had new talent uh, to design a system around. And so what she did is that once that low post player left, she went to more of a pace and space style of offense that emphasizes three-point shooting, something that you might see in the NBA today. 
So with the new set of talent, she designed a different system around that talent. And that unlocked great results on the basketball court. And also spent a lot of time trying to build out behaviors around cultural values of accountability, as well as relationship building. And so again, this was largely the same team. There was one key player that left, but some of the choices that she made in talent and system and culture building is what led to the Las Vegas Aces finally winning a WNBA championship last season under incredibly high expectations that Hammond was under because of her pedigree. And uh, it's just a really good example of the importance of leadership and decision-making in building and managing a high-performing team. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so we spent the last several minutes really talking about these four key components that drive yeah. business outcomes and outcomes in sports. But is luck a factor in any of <laughs> And yeah. would love to just know your thoughts on, on the role of luck in successful outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And there's a big mantra in sports for those of you that are athletes. You'll recognize at least the sentiment behind this, which is you control what you can control because there are so many other external factors that could affect the outcome. Right. Weather, referees, injuries. Right. There are so many external factors that could affect the outcome. And luck certainly plays a role in sports outcomes. No doubt about it. Uh, we have a colleague, Cheng Wei Lu, for those of you that are interested. He teaches at ESMT Berlin and he has wrote an excellent book about luck in the business world. And one of his key ideas is that, especially when you see extreme successes, those are often going to regress to the mean. In other words, you see extreme successes, there's a good chance luck played a role in getting that result. On the other end of the spectrum, if you see extreme losses or extreme failures, perhaps that was bad luck right? So he teaches us to really pay attention to some of these extreme successes and probe whether, is that really because of the talent? Is that really because of the system? Or is that because of other factors that put that team or company in position to succeed in a way that couldn't be replicated? So again, that's just one idea that Cheng Wei Lu has taught us about luck. If you're interested in learning more, please look him up because I think he would give you some really fascinating insights about the role of luck in high-performing teams and organizations. Perfect. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, interesting topic, of course. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk yeah. about some of your current research. So yeah. um, you've uh, been currently focusing on the value of women's sports. Yes. And one of the key insights that you've uncovered is that traditional metrics uh, that have been used are not necessarily relevant mm -hmm. for women's sports and that um, women's sports and, and athletes may require a different set of metrics in order to fully appreciate their value. Mm -hmm. So could you share a little bit more about your, your thoughts and research on this topic? Yeah, absolutely. So, and I should say, I've been working with my colleagues at MIT Sloan, Kate Revis, as well as Shira Springer on some women's sports related work. We've actually written a case on the National Women's Soccer League and uh, Oak actually have some, some uh, a new case that we're working on now. Can't reveal it yet, but we're excited to do that. And as we've been studying women's sports, Jackie, directly to your point, um, this is a very interesting time for women's sports. Uh, what we're seeing is that there's actually growth opportunities that are unprecedented in many ways. For example, when you look at college softball versus college baseball, and I'm talking about the World Series for both of those sports, even on traditional metrics, like television ratings. College softball is often driving more viewers for their World Series than college baseball is for their World Series. So a really good example that even on traditional metrics for some sports, we're seeing tremendous growth in popularity of women's sports. The second factor that is at play as we've uncovered and done more work on women's sports is 
the amount of social media engagement with women sports teams, women athletes, and their fans is quite remarkable. There's a tremendous sense of community on social media around whether it be NWSL teams or softball or volleyball. And that to me is a new source of data to indicate how popular these sports are and what the growth might be like in the future. So it's a very exciting time for women's sports, not only in terms of the action that's happening on the field or on the pitch or on the court, but also as a business proposition. And uh, it'll be a key focus of my work here in the coming months and years ahead. Yeah, well, we certainly look forward to learning more. Yeah, well, thank you for your interest. Absolutely. So I think one final question that we've prepared before we go into the, the audience questions, and sure. I kind of like these to be forward looking and to think yeah. about future. So um, one of the other areas of research that, um, that you focus on and uh, continue to look at is digital transformation. Yes. And the adoption of technology and uh, and through the lens of sports and again how that can be applied in business. Yeah. And so certainly there is a lot of discussion around the metaverse and generative AI. Um, mm -hmm. So could you share a little bit about your thoughts on how those technologies may uh, impact sports moving forward? Absolutely. And you know, just as quick context, there is a long history of sports being an innovation driver for media technologies. So you think back to the early days of radio, you know, one of the primary use cases where people were turning on the radio to listen to the baseball game or the boxing match. You think about television, one of the primary use cases that drove adoption was NFL football. In my own work, in my own life, I saw sports as a key adoption and usage driver for social media, right? So there's a long legacy of sports being a fascinating use case to understand the possibilities of technology and also drive adoption and usage. And I think when we look to the future of things like metaverse and related technologies, it stands to reason that sports will be there too as a fascinating Petri dish to understand how these technologies are being used and applied by fans, as well as by businesses. So that's the frame that I have put on my work in sport and the metaverse. I'll tell you, first and foremost, we don't know yet what the metaverse will be. We really don't. We are still very much in the conceptual stage, right? Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook certainly has a vision of what the metaverse will be. Others in the field have a vision of what the metaverse will be. But if any other technologies have taught us this lesson, it's that the way in which people use that technology, how they experiment with it, how they make it better, that's what's going to determine the course of a technology. And I think the same will be true for the metaverse. So for me, the main thing for the metaverse is these are digital worlds where people feel immersed in the digital world, whether or not they use a headset, whether they they, they are unscripted in that digital world, right? Where it's not like a game where you play a game according to a script, but it's an unscripted experience. And then also it is interactive, enabling you to interact with others. To me, that's that's what that combination of those three characteristics is, is our sort of foundational criteria for the metaverse. But beyond that, I think it's anybody's guess. And it's gonna be fascinating to see the types of innovations that happen over the two or three years ahead. And I can guarantee you sports will be at the leading edge of those innovations. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so now we'll have, we received a, a number of uh, questions that were submitted uh, by the audience today. So we'd like to start with those, but certainly feel free to um, anyone in the audience to put additional questions in the chat and we'll get through as many of them as we possibly yeah, can. Absolutely. That we have. Um, so let's start then with uh, motorsports. So yes. could you share a little bit about uh, your thoughts on just sports analytics and the data-driven decisions um, that are happening in, in professional motorsports? Yes, so I've had the great opportunity to uh, do some work with Formula One. We have written a case study for them from uh, on Formula One uh, that we teach in our sports strategy and analytics course here at MIT Sloan. And then also we did a very innovative uh, 
executive education program with Formula One called the Formula One Extreme Innovation Series. So I've been intimately familiar with Formula One now for a few years. What's fascinating about Formula One from a data and analytics standpoint is that in the early days of Formula One, the most important data source for Formula One teams was the driver. So the driver would take the car around the track and then report back once he got back to the pit stop and share how the car is feeling, what the track is like. So the human, the, the driver was the data source. Mm -hmm. Today, mm -hmm. Formula One cars are essentially computers. The number of sensors transmitting real-time information about the car performance is astounding. And then the analytics and simulations that Formula One teams do based on that data is also remarkable. So for instance, prior to a race day, a Formula One team may do 2 million, perhaps 3 million simulations prior to even racing on the track of what could occur. And then based on those simulations, decision makers during the race can take what's happening real time and then also look at some of the simulation results and make decisions accordingly. So it's a really fascinating field. And to me, it demonstrates the importance of having good human and machine partnerships when making decisions, especially in real time about strategic issues. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Um, so we also received a number of, a couple of questions around uh, health and yes. logical capture of, of data and athlete yeah. privacy concerns. So could you share a little bit about kind of your thoughts there on um, capturing those individual insights for athletes, but also the privacy concerns that they may have or the teams may have about this data? Absolutely. And rightfully so. Look, one of the reasons why sports has been a fascinating place to understand data revolution is because the amount of data that's now available about athletes is significant. So as just an example, right, wearing wearable technologies, you know, trackers during practice, that can yield interesting and large amounts of data about a player. Biometric data, right, is now increasingly available about an athlete. And Every league is a little bit different for the major professional leagues here in the U.S. There is now language in their collective bargaining agreements between the league and the players associations that the data, biometric data or other health related data is owned by the athlete. And there's also some conversations around whether leagues can monetize that data. And that, that's a really interesting uh, area as well, where there's some collective bargaining language around that in some leagues. So what's happening in sports, I think is instructive because when we look at the business context, right? Because of the digitization of work and the fact that companies have access to uh, emails or Slack messages, what some researchers in the field call digital exhaust, right? About how employees are communicating in organizations. We might take a page from a little bit of what we're learning in sports about how sports teams and leagues are treating athlete data and, and consider those types of questions around employee privacy and what data an employee actually owns and can control. Uh, those are the types of questions that I think we're gonna continue to have to face some organizations are facing them now, but especially when there's more data available about employees and their performance and their behaviors, those are going to be some really tough conversations that companies and employees are going to have to have, uh, but it's it's going to be unavoidable given the, the explosion of data going forward. Absolutely. Um, so looking at this from, a, from another angle, one of the questions you received is, how do you see AR or VR as a, as a tool to help particularly yes. Um, kids as athletes to use their bodies more effectively and to avoid yeah. negative outcomes and, and injuries. Could you talk a little about your thoughts there? Yeah, that, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. And I like the term tool in that question, because generally speaking, you know, it's, it's helpful to think about technologies as tools, of course, to solve a particular problem. 
I think the possibilities for both AR and VR devices in sports are really compelling. We, for instance, have seen some initial use cases of football players that, of course, they play a very, very physical sport. And sometimes it's best to not practice to preserve your body for game day, but football's also a, a very strategic sport. So how do you continue to keep the mind sharp while also preserving and protecting your body? That's where things like virtual reality training could come in, right? And we've already started to see some interesting use cases there. I'm fascinated also by AR. There's some interesting apps, for instance, that can use your phone and the camera in your phone to analyze your jump shot and give you tips on how to improve it based on the angles and so on and so forth. So this is a really fascinating area, but it goes back to the term in that question, which is these are going to be interesting tools to help young athletes, as well as uh, athletes that uh, have been around a long time, improve their skills. So I'm very bullish on the use of these various technologies in that way. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I guess building upon that a bit more, since uh, this is an area that seems to be of interest from the audience. Yeah. You talk a little bit about if AI is being used today to interpret data or to make novel coaching decisions. So there are some use cases of that. Um, you know, it's a really fascinating example of coaching decisions, right? Um, because what a machine might recommend in that particular situation based on previous situations could be the right decision, right? Could absolutely be the right decision. But then coaches have to manage other stakeholders, okay? So we have seen as culture has started to change in sports with coaches using data in their decisions more frequently, we've seen sometimes controversy around, okay, the machine suggested we do this, Conventional wisdom says, why in the world would you ever do that, right? And if it goes wrong, then the coach has to answer to the media, or if it's youth sports, to the parents, or to the owner. And it's going to be something that plays out in businesses as well, right? Where the AI model will suggest one course of action. The decision maker, based on their experience and conventional wisdom, might say, hmm, Actually, I see that differently, and yet they might still go with what the data suggests and in the end be wrong. And so you're kind of, as a decision maker, going to be facing these tensions of, do I go with what the data suggests or do I go with what I'm seeing? And the reality is there isn't a good answer. There isn't an you know, absolute answer on what you should do every time. My main message to senior executives is, You've got to look at all the different inputs. And part of the job is weighting the, the different inputs. And every single situation is going to be different. There's going to be some times when what the model suggests is absolutely hands down the right way to go. There are going to be other times where, hey, the model might suggest one thing, but you as a decision maker know, based on being in this industry for 20 years, that the right decision is why. And that's because, you know, maybe there's context that the model doesn't have. So what I'm painting here is that it's both and. It's both data and analytics and AI and intuition. And the challenge of the leader is to figure out the right balance. And uh, it's going to be an ever evolving challenge, but uh, a good problem to have, I think, to some extent. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so talking about the, the job market, for yes. those in the audience who um, have an engineering background or have a background that's, uh, that's different than uh, what might be required in, in sports analytics, do you have any, uh, any advice on transitioning to a, a job in sports analytics? So first of all, I'll say that sports is a growing and more diversified industry. And certainly there are the analytics jobs with teams. 
But there are some interesting jobs at the league level, and there are interesting jobs in the growing sports betting space. There are interesting jobs in the sports metaverse space, uh, merchandising. So what I'm suggesting is that if you widen the aperture on the types of companies and organizations and sports, there are a lot of these companies that have more and more data and could benefit from an engineer to come in and help make sense of that and generate insights as a result of that. So that's the first thing that I would say. Uh, the second thing is one of the key challenges in sports and to some extent sports technology and analytics more specifically is a lot of people want to work <laughs> in these industries. It's tremendously competitive. So the more that you can show your skill set and show what you can do beyond your resume, the better. There have been countless examples now of very talented individuals that have decided to launch a blog that showcases their writing and thinking and work with sports and sports data, which shows a potential employer, hey, this person's got the goods. So I would encourage you, if you're really serious about this, maybe exploring what maybe a side hustle can be. I'm not suggesting you that you launch a blog or a newsletter, but something that could demonstrate that you've got this skill set and you understand sports. Because in the end, especially at the team level, this is a competitive business. And if you can help a team gain a competitive edge based on your unique perspective and skill set, you got a shot. So those are a couple of points that I would make on breaking into the industry. That's great advice. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So another uh, question we received just now was, um, in your opinion, what is uh, the sport that's most difficult to measure ah. or the sport most uh, or least likely, excuse me, to be improved through metrics? Okay. So I can definitely take the first question. Was, which is the one that's most difficult to measure is, in my view, hands down soccer or football, the beautiful game. It is very challenging because everything is so interdependent, right? And when you think about uh, a, a goal that has been scored, chances are that goal scoring possession was a goal because maybe five steps down the line, you know, five passes before. That's what set it off. So it's a very, very difficult sport to analyze. It's getting better. And one of the technologies that's helping is computer vision, which you know helps when you have a computer that is monitoring and tagging and bringing all of these visual moments into a database, that is helping analysts actually make sense of what effective play is and who's really good at doing certain things. So it's a very difficult sport to measure. Even Billy Bean himself famously has called that out. But, you know, as technology continues to advance, we're going to get better at it. And I think it's going to be very exciting to see where that field evolves in the future. Wonderful. Um, so I think uh, now I'd like to turn to a, a topic that I think has been um, interesting and top of mind for many folks. Sure. Um, with Tom Brady, of course, recently yes. announced <laughs> for the second time. Um, can you share your prediction for Tom Brady's future? Will he coach, commentate, continue to commercialize his brand? Um, what do you think kind of his role will be and, and kind of the benefit of his leadership moving forward? So I definitely think he'll continue to commercialize his brand. I think we can definitely bet on that. He has been, I think, pretty aggressive on social media and interacting and engaging with his fans. I expect that to continue. Mm -hmm. I also expect to see the brand of Brady continue to grow. It's a, it's an interesting playbook, right? Um, you know, I think when you look at another goat in basketball, Michael Jordan, right? His Jordan brand through Nike has been a, a critical source of relevance and growth for him uh, since he stopped playing. So, you know, maybe Brady is, is trying to take a page out of that. 
while also weaving in a more active social media presence. He is uh, set, I think, in 2024 to commentate and analyze games with Fox. Uh, we'll see if that happens. Uh, it would be really interesting to hear his insights. I don't expect him to coach. For whatever reason, I just don't expect him to do that. Well, thank you. We will we will see uh, what happens and how it yeah. changes. Thank you very much yes. for your thoughts there. Sure. Uh, I think before we, we wrap up, I'd love to just um, open it up to you, Ben, to share any kind of final thoughts or closing remarks that you might have or any other questions you might want to address. Yeah, absolutely. You know, first of all, I just want to thank you, Jackie and Greg, and for having me. It's just been so much fun to talk about an area that I'm so passionate about and also to reconnect with our alumni community. It's like I mentioned, a real a privilege and, and pleasure. Yeah, I would just say that the, the central point of our discussion today is around how you as a leader can use data to build and manage your team to achieve high performing outcomes more consistently. And no question about it. Sports has led the way here in many respects and is, is, is inspirational, right? And part of that is because there is data available and even new sources of data that are coming in the future. And when you have really good quality data about performance, you can do a lot of different things. So when we shift to the business context, I would just encourage people to think about, okay, when it comes to your team's performance, both at the system level and at the talent level, what types of data are you capturing that can help you make some improvements in, in your team? And maybe that data doesn't exist already. Maybe it's something that you can get creative and start to capture. For those of you that are NBA fans, we have seen a tremendous revolution in three-point shooting in the sport over the last decade or so. Well, my argument is we would have not seen that type of revolution in three-point shooting without these cameras. These cameras are the sport view cameras. There's now a new camera provider by the name of Second Spectrum for the league, but that's neither here nor there. These sport view cameras were introduced in the late 2000s as a test, and then they ended up introducing them across every single NBA arena. There's six of them that capture 25 frames per second. And this new form of data helped really smart individuals like one of our alums, Daryl Morey, better understand the most efficient and effective shots on the court, which include three points sh shots, as well as drives to the hoop. And again, I would argue without this new source of data, we wouldn't have seen the three-point shooting revolution that we've seen in the sport. So again, turning it back to your context, thinking about how you can get creative in data capture to focus on things that could improve your team's performance over time. And I think we're really early with that conversation in many companies, but I encourage you to have it with your teams because with new and better quality data, that can unlock some really innovative ways of driving performance within your organization. Well, thank you, Ben. That's a perfect way to wrap up. We really appreciate you sharing your, oh, your insights and thoughtful comments with us today. It's been a really fun discussion and just thank you very much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Great. Greg, I'll turn it back to you for some final comments and thoughts. Awesome. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Ben. Uh, ben, your image of the Petri dish um, and that sports is a Petri dish for testing and exploring new technologies. Love that visual. I'm going to keep that in the back of my mind for a while now. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but thank you both again for taking the time today uh, and for spending this hour with the alumni community, um, diving into data-driven decision-making and leadership. So thank you both uh, for our viewers. When you close out of the Zoom today, you will see a brief survey that will appear on your screen. So fill that out and let us know your feedback on today's session. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day.